very excited to welcome the dr ajit kumar uh, for today's first keynote um as a bit about uh, uh, ajit kumar uh, he has done his msc and phd in nuclear physics from university of calicut and yeah he has been senior scientist with inter university accelerator center in new delhi so over to you thank you so morning everybody and i'm very happy to be here today talking to you all python whatever i know so first of all let me just share the slides is it is it okay now bhavi yes yes okay so uh, what we will talk about is the role of python see we already had a discussion yesterday about how it should be you know used in our education system and all so i'll talk about the things in a different context because that we mostly a like, coupled with some project which i have been doing so i'll just talk about a little bit about what i have been doing and that's like this is a problem when you call old people so they will still tell old stories okay and then we will just try to see whether our present situation is it really very great or is there is a scope for improvement and uh, about our open source contributions and all and then we will come to the it training at our school level the present status and what are the desirable options and all and here we will spend some time and then we'll also discuss the topic which we had a panel discussion yesterday computer programming for everybody and okay of course this was the link to a some keynote which i gave 6 years back so there will be some repetitions actually and let me start with something about myself uh, i've been working at the Inter university accelerator center in new delhi from 85 to till this year and uh, now i am free from there so i have more free time and here our main job was actually developing and maintaining particle accelerators and here the computers come into the picture uh, in two ways one is designing all the structures you use computers and then in the control systems and the data aggregation systems we use computers and mostly coupled with the different hardware systems like right? data aggregation means you have to control couple it with the real world devices so and also we had a lot of interaction with the universities because it was an inter university center and we were providing particle accelerator facilities to the university i mean the academic community so what we noticed was the air system was actually suffering from a lack of good equipment we had if you see many of you know the college laboratories the equipment currently we have is a little bit outdated and the new equipment it's all available in the market but they are expensive and proprietary solutions there are companies like pasco fiva and all selling all kinds of equipment but it's not really affordable here i have seen only the icers buying some of them and not very many colleges or universities so using our expertise in developing control system and other things we thought why not get into the area of developing some cost effective lab equipment and the concept used was very simple suppose even if you take a thermometer it is also a test equipment so it if you see it has three components one is a tip of it is the sensor and then you have the display and user interface user interface means say, there is a small button to select say fahrenheit or celsius display and then in between you have signal processing that means some electronics will be there so as a cost cutting measure what we thought is let us don't do this part like let a computer take care of that display and user interface and the signal processing along with some interfacing circuit so we make only this middle portion and for sensors whatever available in the market like the consumer electronics a lot of sensors available try to use them to design science experiments that can be used at uh, mainly we targeted bsc level and later on it has spread to 
uh, higher secondary and other levels. And it was decided all these things should be open source. So that there are different uh, reasons for that. One reason is anybody could just take it, manufacture it and use it. So we, we have, I mean, we, we didn't want to have any control on that. So it's an unhindered, you know, development. And then these things can be modified and other somebody else can come and improve that. And, and most importantly, if today we stop, well, that we, that, that's what we thought at that time. Suppose the institute, IUAC, stops this development, still it, will, it could continue if someone else is interested. So that's how we started a project. It was named as Phoenix and it stands for Physics with Homemade Equipment and Innovative Experiments. So the first version you can see very old kind of thing. There's a box sitting here and all this history you'll find in the IUAC website. And this was using parallel port and the uh, interesting part was it was all based on some kernel code there was a device driver so all these real-time measurements like suppose yesterday you saw in that demo like uh, if you have a pendulum or something when you measure accurate timing the kernel itself freezes it makes the measurement but later on then we shifted to other designs like a serial port version with a microcontroller so that at that point the real time work was shifted to a microcontroller then later on versions came with when the usb came we had to catch up with that and finally this is the current version i mean it came in 2017 there jitin did a lot of work in this and it, it's far better than the earlier one so here uh, just if you ask what is this box is exercise it is for students it's an affordable tool for doing experiments and the key is it's like anytime anywhere freedom from lab timing this was something initially we thought of but today it has acquired a uh, special significance because almost uh, all our labs have stopped working because students are attending online classes so theory is going on well but there is no lab sessions and here actually this is a very useful tool because it's it's a small handy thing it can be you know sent to the students and they can do experiments from home and uh, some software has been developed so that the teacher can monitor it over the web so that yesterday it was presented and again for teachers it could be used for uh, classroom uh, classroom demonstrations or our intention was teachers should be able to develop new experiments. So that is where the Python also came into the picture. And for engineers, for engineering students, it's an open system that combines actually basic physics, electronics, and microcontroller programming, and some computer interfacing. Also, this, if you go through this design of this system, that source code, everything is available, one can get some idea how these sort of things are developed and for hobbies of course it is like you kill more time with the less money it's not very expensive toy and and any an important factor was the collective effort it was not the team at iuac doing everything we had a, only two three people doing something but when it was announced on the web and we could attract one number of people and the significant i mean there are many many but i only just mentioning three four and first was actually from both he only came up with the idea of python so the i was doing everything in c and uh, uh, then he just showed that it is better to use python then we had a debian developer he is a school teacher in france he came into the picture and uh, he started packaging this software for debian he also did a lot of work in this localization like translating into different languages and all and Praveen has been very active in this and in 2014 he had developed some experiments under a Google Summer of Code project and later on in 17 and around actually in around 14 onwards Jitin started working on it and uh, after two three years of continuous and full-time work he released a new version and the old that 2006 version actually it was used in what is school of george and so this collective effort actually this idea of collective effort came 
from the free software movement because I was having some familiarity with free software starting from 94 using Linux. And this is something which uh, I feel that everyone in the computer field, especially students, should have a look at it, this gnu.org and fsf.org and all. Because there are so many people like Bill Gates, everyone knows. And Richard Shellman, okay, a smaller number of people know. But the importance of this movement is earlier also, even before, say, in 1983, there were some software which is distributed freely, but it, they were called freeware and it was available on the internet. But what was more important was putting it on a right footing with a proper license, Groove General Public License. And it, it became a very well organized thing. And uh, it was a very daring step on Stallman's side to announce that it will, we will write a completely free operating system. But as you know, around 91, they completed many things except the kernel. And, but some other very interesting development completed it. And that should be an inspiration to the students actually. And if you can look at the search internet, you'll find around say this 25th August 1991 was that historic uh, posting in a news group that was done by Linus Stallworth. He was a computer science student. So this tells you even a, a computer science student, you know how much one can do if proper, you know, that motivation is there and the capability is there. So he announced he is doing a free operating system, say, just as a hobby, won't be big and professional like GNU or something, it's a very modest announcement. And he released, he could release the version 0.99 in 1992 itself. And in March 1994, the kernel version 1 and the existing GNU uh, system, we have a complete OS that was the, we can prefer to call it as GNU in Linux. And I'm, I was fortunate to, you know, come across this somewhere in February, that means just before the version 1 was released. So I was using 0.99 or something. It used to come in some three floppies in those days. But now actually the Linux has come a long way and it has become a very major force in this field. And now I just mentioned how I mean just how I came across Python and, and what was the reason. See when I wrote this uh, first version the software, uh, the only language uh, mostly I was using C because earlier it was Fortran then just to C and uh, uh, because C is good for communicating the hardware. But when I started writing an oscilloscope and just to give something quite rudimentary looking like this, it was running into hundreds of lines of code with the existing tools available in those days in under Linux. So that time only promote told okay just this is another option. So I switched over to Python. And the result was really fantastic because when you could make very complex systems like this, with a very little effort, because all these things, uh, each experiment you now is only 100 lines or 200 lines at the maximum with all these features. Because Python libraries like PyCute and all gives you all the you know required support. So this was just one example experiment we have put here. And what you see here is this thing measures the frequency, phase difference, and all. But actually, there is no frequency meter or phase meter all done in uh, using this data analysis of SciPy because you have two sine waves and if you capture two sine waves into software you can fit it with a mathematical equation find out the frequency and you can also find out the phase difference so a lot of things are just done in software because of the uh, python libraries mainly numpy and SciPy. And all these developments, I am not going into the you know, details, everything you will find in this website, expise.in. So here, what are the experiments supported, all those things, if anybody interested, they can see there. I mean, even the hardware availability or design and uh, software, everything is there. And we were also conducting teacher training. It was mainly for physics teachers from the colleges and universities 
So 2005 onwards, we might have trained nearly 1,000 teachers in our one-week training program. And then also conducted more than 100 one-day workshops at different places uh, to promote uh, this device as well as Python and free software, of course. And these details you will find in the IUNC website. So the topics that what we taught during these programs were basically some scientific computation and after teaching a little bit of Python and some experiments and all based on open hardware and software. So this was the uh, scheme that we were running. And incidentally, I also wrote a book that was meant for uh, BSc mathematics students. It is downloadable. You can either get it from uh, expice.in or in this site, scischool.in. That will come to that later on. But it's downloadable. It's mainly focusing on applications in uh, like science and mathematics. And Python, of course, we started using Python just for this uh, outreach project. But later on, we found that our particle accelerator control, because uh, let me just say something about this accelerator control. This is something called a beam line. You can see here the high voltage structures are there. But all of them are interfaced to the computer. Like here, what you see, this blue thing is a huge electromagnet. And the current through that, everything is uh, set from a computer. So what we do is we have some special interfacing hardware that is connected to a computer. And this whole thing, the network runs some server like that as well, written in C. But the front end, we could write it in Python to make uh, the job very easy. Like here, three lines of code. And this is just reading one parameter from the system among these 2000 signals. So uh, any parameter in this uh, system can be accessed with one line of code. So this helped our uh, other experts, I mean, the accelerator field, who doesn't know programming. So they could write small scripts and access it. So Python was very useful that way. And now, so, so far I've been talking about something which uh, I was personally involved. And now the question is, if we are doing all these things, our intention is, okay, situation should improve some way or other. So that way it is relevant to ask a question because sometimes people already say we are already a super power in software and all. So it, it, sometimes it is better to have a sort of uh, assessment ourselves on using maybe simple parameters. I may be wrong in this, so but it's just I'm introducing that like just putting forward the idea we should do that. Suppose if we are really strong in software, probably we should have had many of these packages, I mean, Indian products. Because when I look for a CAD package, electronics, mechanical, or anything, I don't find. They are all uh, companies are from abroad. And other applications like weather forecast, or even language compilers, or operating systems. We don't really see local products, right? And this is one area where I was, in, I mean, having some experience is uh, simulations that is mainly for uh, this nuclear physics computations and modeling, nuclear physics model, nuclear modeling. And another one was basically designing of accelerators. In both cases, actually, we did not have much uh, indigenous software. So, so many people working in software and we are earning a lot of money in software, then why uh, these uh, things are not happening. So that is something one should think about. I don't know, I'm not that an expert in those areas, but that question should be asked. And also, incidentally, uh, in an interview with Linus Torvalds, so interviewer asked him about the contribution of kernel code from India. So his uh, reply was very polite, but he made some important points. What it, what he mentioned was, you can go and see this, you know, watch this video. It is there, but it could have been much, you know, more considering the fact that India has a large number of educated English speaking people, but still the contributions are, I mean, not that much. And he also makes some observation like, uh, for people like him, 
coding came as a hobby first and then it became a job and he says suppose software first it become a job or a profession then probably open source may not happen and open source will happen suppose if you take it as a hobby and then you move into that profession so that that is his you know kind of views on that maybe you can watch this video and find out but all i am trying to tell you is like probably as he mentioned we could have done better and if you are not doing then what could be the reason one observation is we have it education even starting from school level somehow or other we are see all cbse schools you will find a computer lab is there but what are we teaching what i observed is we teach computer applications how to use it how to use it as a typewriter how to use it as a calculator but we are not really teaching programming this programming is we are teaching only the those a small number who are selecting computer science all others are just left behind and why that is done maybe they are not capable so here i have some personal observation but it cannot be taken as a sort of you know authenticated fact this is only an anecdotal evidence in 97 uh i along with uh, some of my friends we conducted a camp in one school a vacation camp after these uh, in may after the exams and around 100 students were there they were all just finished their 10th standard written their 10th standard exam and all were malayalam medium students and what we thought is we will teach them to use this because those days those was prominent well nets was not quite common and the basic concepts like files directories and all those things and after that if time permits they were they were permitted to do some basic programming because it was part of ml those the interpreter was there and that time what i noticed was those who were just doing their basic programming they were picking up things very fast because they were really fascinated by drawing a circle or something on the screen and just to making a multiplication table or something so that means that it is not a such a great thing probably you could teach it to anyone but in the beginning when the dose was there okay you had the basic interpreter but then later on things changed probably because we got into this windows os and at that point one thing very i i, I would say personally a very harmful thing happened probably is we started pushing the office packages as educational software even today you will see that in all this uh, you know what we are teaching at the school level uh, it is like word processing and spreadsheet or you know just making presentations so to plot a graph you will struggle with a spreadsheet excel or you know calc or whatever it is and then another very futile exercise is making these presentations just making fancy things and you know it doesn't really contribute to the understanding then in word processing we we focus more on type setting how the font should look good and capital italics everything than the content and if you go for latex or something you would get a much better output especially when it involves mathematical equations but we did not Uh, probably emphasize those things and we went this office route i mean office packages and probably that has done some harm and someone else also pointed out the same this was if you go to the website of uh, this particular website which talks about this uh, raspberry pi history and you know the origin of raspberry pi project it's it's very old i mean like it's a few people from oxford cambridge and from I main industry they were trying to address some issues and this was the issues and the main concern was the students who were coming to join the computer science program at cambridge in the 90s those who coming for the interview they say they were experienced hobbyist programmers and the landscape in 2000 was very different after 10 years a typical applicant there he has done some web design or of course the office package so what they conclude is uh, what the something has changed the way kids were interacting interacting with the computers 
and one problem they ident uh, identified is the colonization of ICT curriculum with the lessons on using Word and Excel or writing web pages. And I would agree with this thing because we also observed the same thing because I have seen like in 8th or 9th standard the question paper which my son wrote and the one question is what is the function of the home key and what he is expected to write is how it behaves in the word application. So it went to that level and and what is the alternate route actually. So we let us think about that. Why not use IT as a supporting tool in education? Like we need computation, simulation, data visualization, and where does Python fit in this? So can we use Python as a tool for that? And how much effort is required? What are the benefits? Let us have a quick look at that. First thing is, it is easy to learn, no doubt, because a Hello World program in C++ is this much, and this is in Python. So there is no mugging up required, actually, right? So, and here I would say, I mean, C is my favorite language, but as a first language, probably this is not advisable. C is good. If you are programming hardware very close to hardware, then it is good. So now, how good it is, let us just ex explore some simple examples. It is for you to judge they are useful or not. Like here, say, just one for loop. And this formatting string is not compulsory. Suppose if I simply say print trial star 5, still the answer will be there. But making a multiplication table is two lines of code. So that means we are not learning Python. Actually, we are programming to learn something else. So we can explore these or make tables or print them, all those things. For that sake, you learn the syntax of Python. So that becomes a secondary thing, but indirectly you will start learning. So you start using it in a different manner. So another simple one like one equation and you want to see the time displacement plot. Why I put this is, this equation is there in the 11th textbook and graph also is there. But how to get from this equation to graph? Either you have to do it manually in a graph paper or forget about it. But these few lines of code does the job. Now something slightly more involved because many people, I mean, you know that we are using a three phase supply. And all of us know it is a 230 volt supply. But if you take a voltmeter and measure between two phases, it is 400 volts. And the electricians know that. But even those who know that, engineers, if you ask them why it is 400, why 213 minus 230 is 400? Because you, when you measure between these two lines, means you are measuring the difference, right? So difference between two phases, why it is 400? But it is quite easy to plot the three sine waves and plot the difference. You immediately see that why it is so. Because when one phase is going up, the other phase is in the other direction. So always the difference will be more. And here the advantage is now student can explore, suppose a four phase AC, AC how it will behave. If it is a two phase, how it will behave. Why people went for three phase instead of two phase. All questions can be asked and explored. So that Python acts as a tool there. Now, let me just take something from mathematics, a toy. So this is something which you can buy in the market. You go to a toy store, you can buy a spirograph. And you see here, there is a big wheel with a tooth inside and a small wheel with, again, tooth wheel. So in this smaller wheel, there are holes. You put a pen or pencil here and start moving this, I mean, without slipping, because the tooth is provided for that. And then this pen will you know, it will go through a trajectory. You can see patterns like this. So it is an interesting, you know, kind of hobby, plotting different packages. Suppose if you know a bit Python and or you want to explore this, you don't need this toy. actually. So here you see some code because when you have big circle, small circle and movement of this point is just given by this equation. And you can refer to Wikipedia here. So all you need to know is this x and y you calculate and do a plot. And here you can see this is radius of small wheel and this is the big wheel radius. And this parameter decides, you know, where is this hole in the, from the center, how far is this hole. So now I have put 
three patterns here for different values 1.6, 1.5, and 2.5. So, this sort of things probably when you are doing it, you know, in H standard or N standard thing, it may be a bit, you know, fascinating that time. And in that process, you will learn Python better. And this is another call, it's a real simulation, like how an electron or a charged particle moves in an electric and magnetic field, this path. This is just picture is there in the 12th standard uh, textbook, but you can do the computation, like you use the Lorentz equation, and from the force you calculate the trajectory. So such things, I mean, simple examples, I have given only a few examples, but that must give you an idea. So that means advantage is easy to learn than open source and we have modules for scientific computation, data visualization and of course there is a large user community and good documentation. So that's the advantages. And now we will see what more we can do now. I mean suppose somebody wants to contribute to this area, what can be done? If you look at the web what I have found is there is a lot of material to learn Python programming, plenty of tutorials, books, everything. And a lot of simulations are also available, but they are all slightly involved. So you can run them, but you may not understand it fully. But like small program, five lines, ten lines, which I showed you, like uh, that uh, paragraph or this uh, charge particle trajectory, that kind of code fragments uh, I don't find very many. So probably if somebody is interested and if they think this is a proper route to go. What we can do is, uh, we should make a collection of such programs. I started doing a little bit, a small collection you will find in this expice.in, that Python tab you will find something. But the real big work is make a Python companion for all textbooks at high school. That you can do for physics, chemistry, maths, everything. And what this uh, companion book should have, book can look into the problems or even the graphs shown in the book and equations. And probably we can just to do, I mean, how to get those graphs from this equation or problem solving other things. And another area of interest is probably documentation in Indian languages. So people can contribute there. And this is about hardware. Like we don't really need to spend big money on uh, laptop or PCs. Raspberry Pi should do our job if you see a school computer lab. And why I'm saying that is even the old version of Raspberry Pi, this I gave in a one side Pi or somewhere, I think. This you can see the XPyC is running and some other simulation is running. Even Mayavi was able to run on one GB RAM Raspberry Pi. So it, it's a very uh, cost effective and uh, less polluting and less power consuming solution. So now next thing where Python can be useful is at least some of you may be electronics engineers or doing microcontroller programming and all of you know about Arduino. It's a very good thing but only problem is their website itself clearly says it is for non-programmers. It is not meant for engineers actually. It is for amateurs, artists and all to get something done because the policy is to hide the microcontroller. So those who are uh, very comfortable with Arduino and when you ask them, okay, tomorrow you go and do a, a big programmer other than this AVR. So they are having a little bit of difficulty because this what you learn on Arduino doesn't uh, get translated into that because the core microcontroller features are hidden. So for that, we started a project some time back, I mean, maybe 10 years back called MicroHope. It was microprocessor for hobby programming and education, something like that. But later on, there is another version called Kutipai was introduced. And that you will find here, you can download the software from there. And here the approach is, you have a Python program and you have a small hardware board which is having an Atmega32 uh, with a USB to serial interface. And what it supports is, uh, you can access all the microcontroller registers from Python and you can run Python scripts. Suppose you can connect an LED and you can write a Python code to make a blinking LED or something. And once you are comfortable with the microcontroller register, all those things without coding the microcontroller actually, 
and then you can start writing in C or assembler and like Arduino you can do a single click upload as well. So now you can search this website and the mainly the development is there is a GUI and all then also the bootloader and I think there are bootloaders that you can put into Arduino boards also Arduino Nano or something so you can convert an Arduino Nano using a USB ASP programmer or something then it will behave like a Gutify board so you can use all these software so this is something which probably a useful development and uh, this I am putting here because it's mainly as I told you I have been working in one place for around 35 years and this year that is over so this website I have set up actually SciSchool.in as a platform to you know put all my uh, works and maybe coordinating the things. So what I am planning now is sharing some knowledge whatever way we may be conducting small courses or something Python microcontroller and some science experiment and also the learning management system model. and also how to set up similar things like this on the cloud how do you set up all these servers and all. And here I have put a link here if you come to SciSchool.in you if you think uh, and you should be informed about you know further development if I start doing something you can put your contact information there so that you will know if something happens here. This was another area and now I am continuing to interact is so this is in IUPAP the international organization there is there are different commissions in uh, different subjects for that there is something called uh, commission C13 for physics for development in that we have a small group for affordable scientific instruments so here also mainly what we are doing is uh, looking for proper open hardware things that are useful in the field of education and uh, compiling it here and also planning to support in different ways so this is some work which is going on at a different level and now let me just finally let me come to this uh, point just to make a couple of comments so yesterday in the panel discussion it, it uh, there are I mean some arguments like should we teach programming to everybody or we should teach only a selected ones I mean if everybody goes after computer programming it is not really helping the education that is one argument and okay let everyone learn computer programming that's another argument so but whatever is the fact I, I strongly recommend you people to go and read this document so if you go to or you can simply search this but it is uh, python.org doc essays uh, cp40 computer programming for everybody so here this is a very good document it was prepared in 1919 and when Guido himself submitted this as a proposal and uh, from this proposal there are very interesting points in this proposal I just picked up a couple of them like what will happen if the users program their own computers so it's a very far-fetched idea and he says we compare this mass ability to read and write the mass literacy and call it as now a software literacy I mean it, it becomes a mass programming literacy kind of thing that is what they imagine so and the requirements because this is written in 99 and most of the requirements they have met actually developing a new computer curriculum that is if you look at it many places it has already taken place and also the tool the Python has become a good tool for so I would recommend maybe you should have a look at this and my view is that it should be taught to all and I take this argument like you teach a skill doesn't mean that that should become a profession like uh, we all want to drive learn driving right even before the age of 18 you start learning driving but you are not going to join Uber or Ola as a program as a driver right taxi, taxi driver but you want to stay, you know still learn that skill similarly we should treat programming even if you are not becoming a professional programmer or we are not going to take it as a job it is better to learn that skill because it is not that tough and it may help you doing the other things slightly better okay that is my opinion now let me summarize what we 
talk so far that means considering situation like our uh, contribution I mean, contribution in the open source seems to be less and that means we need more number of good programmers and to have more number of good programmers you should have a much larger number of programmers because among the programmers when you do the sampling there will be good programmers so that means you have to widen the sampling base that means there should be more people exposed to the programming and how to do that and indian situation the best place is actually the school the conventional school if we start using software as an enabling tool to teach the core subjects it may happen and python language seems to be suitable for that purpose at the moment and another factor is the current system of teaching the office packages in the name of education software it should go probably because if there is no need students can do it themselves and the python enthusiasts like you probably you can help preparing material or lead some projects so that or or you make something and uh, go to your own you know wherever you have done your schooling and contact them and just try to push this idea if you consider it is worth and as such i am looking for collaborators as i told you somebody who wants to me to you know be in touch with you just put your contact information on that website so i will use that as a that as a platform so more or less uh, that is all i wanted to share with you today and uh, maybe you people can say something i mean question means i am not going to give an uh, like an authoritative answer i will just express my views and uh, your question will be probably you can express your views as well it need not be called a question and answer that way please go Sorry. awesome awesome that was really insightful definitely so let's wait for a couple of seconds and there are few questions or uh, points to discuss i will uh, show those to you shortly Uh, can you expand a little on how xpies makes the actual interfacing between the sensor input and the python happen okay so uh, there see it is done like this you just take a microcontroller and write some software so that you can interface it to the pc uh, through this i mean usb port now because you say usb to serial converter right and interfacing the sensors it is done in two ways one is the microcontroller see one port is going to that but there are other pins where you can connect see adcs are there and lot of digital converters are there and it has the timer counters and all those internal resources where you can make signal generator all those things and it also has the i2c interface and spi interface so either we use an adc suppose say one simple example is we have adc channels so we make a digitizer connect a simple condenser microphone and you digitize sound so you can do a nice experiment to measure the velocity of sound and it costs you only 10 rupees and next step in the new version you have the capability to connect the i2c sensors if you guys see the slides the video of yesterday just in presented there's a wide range of sensors available and they are only 100 a couple of 100 rupees so they are getting interface to the i2c interface so here the role the xpies is Uh, playing is I, I i tell you right from the beginning in 2005 we put one line on our website is that is to develop science experiments without getting into the details of computer programming that is one line or electronics because if you want to write i to c code a programmer can do that who knows c and all those things but here what we do is xpies provides the code which will communicate to the i2c device and all that low level code and you can write code on the python side just calling this code on the other end to plot the graphs and other things so it's a kind of job division so that is how it is done and the entire circuit schematic and all those things are actually available on the website so if you really want to 
but i would recommend if, if anyone wants to make such a thing like a box whatever you call it which is connected to usb port and you want to do a sort of communication and connect sensors you should start with qtpy because it is a simple point to start with and avr these processors are plenty and you can use any arduino board also to do that and there you will find if you go to qtpy website or the micro website there is oscilloscope code which is 50 lines 60 lines still working as an oscilloscope without bells and whistles so this is all i can say but complete details you can get from the site huh? all the details schematic everything okay uh, do you feel making the primary language for students in 11th and 12th in python uh, better than in c yeah okay see this is the in, in again see it has been done now some experts from iit and all in the committee finally said we should teach python but uh, even before that maybe for the past uh, 10 15 years i have been telling this for the following reason because we have been teaching c and c++ or mainly c++ in the uh, 11th and 12th as a separate subject and it has no connection with mathematics or physics or chemistry or anything so it was doing a parallel run but when you go to python instead of c what will happen is you can convert that into a supporting tool for the learning the core subjects and once you know programming for any language switching on to another language is quite easy so that way switching from python to c c++ is not that difficult but starting with c++ i would say even though i started with fortran then to c c++ like that but after seeing python i find that this is a good starting point it may not be good for all the things but uh, it seems like better than c Uh, as a first language, and especially when it's you see, it's uh, I already showed you some examples, uh, considering its capability to support the core subjects like math, science, or chemistry, and uh, so that is my view on that. All right. Um, the next one is: Do you see the application of programming in non-science subjects like fine arts, linguistics? uh yeah linguistics etc very hard to come in you know fine arts and all yesterday we had the panel discussion right so you remember uh, madam was telling that the way in which her field of work got really changed when she learned programming also i can only just believe that because since <laughs> art is not something which <laughs> i should comment on but right. i think it should probably change slightly you know improve the things and it may help this that's what i feel it, it won't do any harm definitely maybe check out the recording of the discussion of yesterday for those who have missed it it, um, it was a very hot discussion actually <laughs> because both the points were presented mm -hmm. next one is uh, for people who have come through the education system uh, like we discuss right now do you see a way to still evolve out of the mindset of programming for jobs well uh, see that is once you are through with it and if suppose you take computer science as your subject and all then you obviously they will be looking for programming jobs and uh, so whoever has gone through that i mean there is nothing much we can because they already know programming they will stay there All I'm trying to tell you is, suppose the other side was a physics or mathematics uh, person who has come out of the course without any uh, training in uh, computers, they could still start. So they can make up for what is lost. So at least when they will be teaching that subject, that becomes useful for the next generation. So or it will help them in a different way. Actually, see in the, this context, I, I, I can tell you. I mean, someone asked me to. teach some python and finally i asked about the nature of the people who want they are basically they want to analyze some data because they are mostly playing with probably spreadsheet and all so i just uh, had a look at it and i i find that even in a spreadsheet 
suppose if i select some column put some conditions everything i can do following the gui but if i know the code and it just two three lines and writing and it becomes much easier so you are uh, when you are using a gui okay you can do everything but the amount of effort you are putting there is probably much more so uh, learning a little bit of scripting will help I mean, you don't have to call it as a full stretch programming or anything i hope it answers I, I, i'm not sure Uh, the next one is uh, what is python support for dsp uh, which is digital signal processing do we have uh, python yes, modules i have us? not come it may be there but i have not come across actually dsp i have not used dsp no <laughs> i cannot answer that it may be there not come across okay i don't see any other questions but there have been lot of discussion in the chat people were agreeing about the points they were putting up their uh, thoughts and opinions so yes yeah. that's more important because their views are as important as our views right so it's and, and ultimately they are going to decide the young ones are going to decide which way things will go right because for them it's morning and for me probably it's more or less evening so it is it makes a big difference definitely um i guess that's all the questions we had okay good so i hope they will continue I mean, people will continue to interact and uh... okay um there is one uh, maybe we can uh, have that question and then yeah sure yeah time is there right yeah i do think having the ability to switch courses subjects more easily while pursuing be which is bachelor of engineering i guess okay, yes, will yes, help yes, a lot yes. yeah do you yes. agree and how easy or hard it would be it's actually uh, it's it's a question to a expert in education probably but still i can express my views see we are the products like our system has been very rigid like you will learn as once you select when you enter the college you make a choice and uh, you exit with the same choice you cannot make any change in between but that is not the case uh, in many places it was not like that and now we are slightly uh, the, our system is also changing giving some flexibility and we should also see that the whole scenario is changing now if you see the edx and coursera Uh, yesterday there was an argument it is only helping people who already have some background but i really don't think because i sometimes take some uh, you know courses on biology or something where i have no base but it it's quite useful actually and then and, and it it's, it's slightly better than you know reading a book or you know watching video but at least some assessment or those things that so things are changing actually so we uh, we should have the flexibility i would say but at the same time some amount of certain stuff should be covered i mean that means there should be a fixed part but there should be some part of it should be kind of students choice so it should not be that rigid but our system is changing now so that is a good thing now actually our universities are also considering those changes so i, I would say it should change for you know more flexibility great um Yeah, that's all we had. Okay. Uh, thank you. Everybody. Thank you so much for a great talk. Okay. Thank you.